Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 20 through 26. And we're going to cross-reference a little bit of 2 Kings 24 and a couple of passages out of Jeremiah. Here's the text. In the eleventh year, in the first month, on the seventh day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Okay, so this puts us about the time of the Babylonian captivity. This is, I think, 586 BC. Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Look, it has not been bandaged, no medicine has been applied, and no splint put on, uh, put on to bandage it so that it can grow strong enough to handle a sword. Okay, uh... Let's pause right here. I believe this is talking about uh, the defeat of Pharaoh Necho, who's really uh, Necho II. Uh, this is when he lost the battle of Karshemish and uh, kind of gave rise to the Babylonian Empire's expansion. And you'd have this ongoing period of conflict between Babylonia and Egypt. This was a pivotal loss Hence, the broken arm that can't be healed. You're going to see Ezekiel 30 go, to, go on to describe the breaking of the other arm. And I believe that's referring to Pharaoh Hophra, this further defeat. Okay, so when you see the first broken arm, my interpretation is that's about Pharaoh Necho. And then the second broken arm, I think that's about Pharaoh Hophra. We had... Uh, Somewhere in the middle here, Pharaoh Samtik or Psameticus, the first who came before Pharaoh Necho the second. And I think that Pharaoh uh, Sa Psamtik or Psameticus uh, the second is the one with whom Zedekiah would make this alliance. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong. It's one of these pharaohs, but that could be what incurred the teaching about God's judgments in Ezekiel 23, equating the northern kingdom to a woman named Ohola and the southern kingdom to uh, Ohola Ba, these lustful sisters who formed alliances with Egypt, thinking that would be a military treaty that protected them rather than relying on God's protection. And then as it would turn out, as we saw a couple devotions ago, that would be like leaning on a staff that turns out to be made of reed. It's hollow inside. It crumples. It crushes. It tears the shoulder. Uh, while Israel, while Judah was wrong to depend upon Egypt militarily, God also dealt with Egypt for letting Israel down militarily. So um, you're going to see this broken arm imagery referred to the first broken arm, and I think that's Pharaoh Necho the second. And when you see the next broken arm, I believe that's Pharaoh Hophra. Okay, here's uh, Jeremiah. 42, 46 verse 2, I think this is in reference to the first broken arm about Egypt and the army of Pharaoh Necho, Egypt's king, which was defeated at Karshemish on the Euphrates River by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in the fourth year of Judah's king Jehoiakim, son of Josiah. Okay, so we have Jehoiakim and his son uh, Jehoiakim, also known as Jeconiah or Coniah for short. His son is the one who's just shipped off to Babylon and spends decades there and kind of like becomes a Babylonian. Uh, he's the one who's like the, the lion cub who gets caught in the net and dragged away, as we've seen in our curriculum in this series. And then uh, Jehoiakim's brother is renamed Zedekiah and turns out to actually be a treacherous king. So uh, this, I believe, is, is the first broken arm uh, that's in view here. Okay, so... That's the first broken arm, and it's not been bandaged. No medicine has been applied. No splint has been put on it so that it can grow. It, it's, it, there, Egypt is still reeling from the defeat at Karshemish, and Babylon is like the world superpower now. And so Egypt is not what she once was. Verse 22, therefore, this is what the Lord God says. Look, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I will break his arms, both the strong one and the one already broken, and will make the sword fall from his hand. I will disperse the Egyptians among the nations and scatter them among the countries. I will strengthen the arms of Babylon's king and place my sword in his hand. But I will break the arms of Pharaoh and he will groan before him as a mortally wounded man. I will strengthen the arms of Babylon's king, but Pharaoh's arms will fall. They will know that I am the Lord when I place my sword in the hand of Babylon's king and he wields it against the land of Egypt. When I disperse the Egyptians among the nations and scatter them among the countries, they will know that I am the Lord. So 
I think we've seen Pharaoh Necho's fall. That's the defeat at Karshemish, recorded later in Jeremiah. And then we see this imagery of the broken arm that hasn't been properly bandaged, and then the other arm's going to be broken. Here's what I think this prophecy in Ezekiel 30 is about, the well-documented defeat, not only of, of Necho at Karshemish, but also Hophra, which is what's being prophesied here. This was written before that. Um, Jeremiah 37, verse 5, Pharaoh's army had left Egypt, and when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard the report, they withdrew from Jerusalem. 2 Kings 24, 7, now the king of Egypt did not march out of his land again, for the king of Babylon took everything that had belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River. We have multiple defeats of Egypt here uh, at the hands of the Babylonians in view in this prophecy in Ezekiel 30. So I think what we're seeing is the fall at Karshmish and then also this upcoming prophesied defeat uh, by uh, uh, the defeat of Pharaoh Hophra. And it would lead to uh, an increase in power for Babylonia, 40 years of dispersion for the Egyptians, uh, but they would eventually come back to their homeland. They would need to be because they're there uh, after Alexander the Great does, uh, dies and was at 333 BC. And then uh, his empire is scattered among his generals and Ptolemy is the one who gets put over the remains of Egypt. Now, look at the point of this prophecy. They will know that I am the Lord when I place my sword in the hand of Babylon's king and he wields it against the land of Egypt. Okay, as we dig into the archaeological record, we see proof that this happened. And as we read the word of God, we, we know that this happened. When I disperse the Egyptians among the nations and scatter them among the countries, they will know that I am the Lord. So there it is. The purpose of this prophecy is in verses 25 and 26. They will know that I'm the Lord. They will know that I'm the Lord. There are people who don't really know that the Lord is God until they have come under his judgment. And at that point, it's too late. God has said what he's going to do, and then he does it. Uh, we had fair warning, you know, uh, 2 Kings 24 chronicles what happened. Uh, Jeremiah called it uh, as well. And then Ezekiel's foretelling the, the fall of, of Pharaoh Hophra to Nebuchadnezzar. He's, he's saying that it's going to happen before it happens. Now you and I read the historical account and it has happened. So we have the benefit of learning the easy way rather than the hard way, such as being one of the fish in the river, uh, to, to borrow from Ezekiel's own imagery in his oracles against Egypt here, uh, the fish in the river that are all put out on dry land. It's better now to read about what happened to the Egyptians, see it verified in the historical record, uh, than it is to be one of those Egyptians. Likewise, you and I have this book of Ezekiel. We're studying the book of Daniel. We're going to study the book of Revelation. And they all include prophecies about the end of days. And so uh, this is about us. Let it not be the story that we learn the hard way that the Lord is God. These people knew that the Lord is God after they faced his judgment. May the people in your life learn that the Lord is God before they face judgment, because God has done everything he said he would do, all right? Just ask the legacies of Pharaoh Necho and Pharaoh Hafra.